as I promised, we're back another week, another awesome guest. You've seen his name. Let's get into it because I'm super pumped for this. Help me welcome the head coach of Carroll University in beautiful, beautiful Wisconsin, Mr. Sean Tealit. Sean, how are you, sir? I'm excellent. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. You know, it was a struggle to get you on. Uh, you know, you had a late practice, so I want to make sure your cross country team better do really, really good this year because they caused me a whole 20 minute delay. <laughs> <laughs> I think they enjoyed the beach down at the lakefront after oh, their day. So I've been down there. It's gorgeous. I can, I know why it went late because it's so beautiful. You don't want to leave. So it makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Uh, man, Sean, so excited for you to be here, man. You've got an amazing story that I'm super excited to delve into and learn more. And honestly, I just kind of want to hop into this, man. So why don't you start us off kind of your uh, origin story, if you will, right? Like when did the spider bite you and you became Spider-Man? Talk to us about track. When did track kind of come into your life? Well, um, you know, I, I guess I did track in seventh grade, you know, kind of, uh, for, for fun, some of the other guys are doing it. Um, the coach at the time saw my times in gym class, you know, with the presidential fitness test, saw the mile run. He's like, hey, I think you could do okay. And I'm like, whatever, yeah, yeah, whatever. All right, I'll come out, I'll pull vaults. Nope, that didn't work, that was too short. Um, I'll try hurdles, nope. I tripped over the hurdles because once again, I was too short. Um, and that's when we pull vaulted into like bags of foam, like pieces of foam. So the oh, old- man. Uh, the old aluminum crossbar that bent every time you kicked it. Did you have the, the triangle one? More. Yep. Uh, you know, being a manufacturer now, you know, all of them are fiberglass and, and o, o, not ovals, but circles, right? Whoever came up with the triangle idea, like I want to hunt that person down, but like, why did you ever think that was know. a good idea? Even like, a, even like a steel pipe, they had steel pipe back then. So yep. even a steel pipe would have been better than a pointy triangle that no matter how you hit it, you were going to hit the point. Yep. Yeah. And it always bent. And always, been, always. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never, never, never. Uh, interesting. So you tried different events. What, tried, where did you go? Yeah, yeah, I tried everything. And then uh, I ran the mile in seventh grade and did very well. Um, but once again, I, I was young enough and, you know, I, I could do anything. It didn't matter. Um, and then I decided eighth grade not to run. I decided to work uh, up in Wisconsin Dells, originally from Burbu. So oh, I'm yeah. sure it was Wisconsin Dells. So yeah. um, started working for a family up there and I ended up working for that family for He's eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, senior summer, freshman year, sophomore year. So like wow. seven to eight years. So that was my job. Was Wisconsin Dells what it is today back then? Like, yes, it was, um, it was well, it was family land instead of the names were changed, but like it was big water parks, but not the indoor park hmm. aspect that it is now. And that's the big draw. Now, I know they've really reinvented themselves here with, um, with like Chua Vista built the bubble um, kind of right by Chua Vista. There's a bubble that they did. I know my daughter competed there for national gymnastics. You know, they have the baseball tournaments, you know, all these tournaments, volleyball, um, um, indoor things that just keeps the Dells going year round. When I was there, it was Memorial Day through Labor Day. And that was it. Yeah, I I would assume like 99% of all teenagers worked at something with the Dells, but this was a different family or what? Um, no, they, they owned, uh, I don't mind a plug here, Baker Sunset Bay Resort on Lost Canyon Road. Great place to stay. Still. Okay, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, so Barry Baker and, uh, and Joe Baker, uh, my mom and dad actually worked there. And then I came on <laughs> um, and I, through the years, my mom uh, worked there for a few more years and my dad and I worked there, but I, I went full time in the summer, um, seven days a week and uh, learned to uh, uh, Barry and Joe were awesome. They were great bosses. Um, and, uh, Barry taught me a lot about work and, you know, what expectations are and, um, how to look busy when, when you want to look busy and when you don't want to get found, you know, but, um, just great people to work for still in touch with the family, um, oh, cool. and their, their kids and that. So, um, Ryan Groy, who plays in the NFL, uh, he was drafted by the, he was, not drafted out of Wisconsin, but he played for the Bears his rookie year. Uh, Ryan and I, I introduced him to his first Big Mac. Um, so <laughs> we always chat about that. A lot of good fun. Um, but yeah, so um, just a really good, that that, that kind of introduced me to that work atmosphere, but a family atmosphere at the same time. Um, and I, I think I, I've taken a lot from that and applied it to as I became a coach and you know, went along the way, there's a lot of times where I reflect back to that and think about, yeah, it is, 
you know, it is about family and things you do. It, it makes you enjoy things that you do. It makes you want to work more. It makes you take more pride in what you do. Um, so, you know, um, and that was eighth grade. That's kind of where that all began. But then, um, so back then, seventh and eighth and ninth grade were at the junior high. And then 10th, 11th, and 12th were at the Baribus, um Senior High. And a uh, gentleman by the name of Peter Arndt, he was... Uh, an aerial studies, social studies teacher uh, for freshmen. Um, and I worked in the, in the library at the, at the junior high. He would come in, his, office, his classroom was right across from him. He'd always walk through, hey, 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 hey. You know, always saying, hi, how you doing, how you doing? And then he comes up one day and he goes, hey, I know you probably like football, but you're a cross country guy. And I'm like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> he, he convinced me, hey, look at your times. You're not very big. You're strong, but you're not very big. So you're, you know, you're, you're a cross country guy. I think you could have a lot of success at it. And so uh, he convinced me to, to do it. My mom certainly loved it because she would watch my seventh and eighth grade football games like, uh, like this. And, um, you know, I, I didn't grow over five feet until I was a junior. Um, so I was a tiny kid, uh, but I volunteered to be nose tackle. I just, um, the first, <laughs> First game against the kid, he, I just put my helmet down and ran for it. After wow. that, he, uh, he knew to uh, move very quickly. Otherwise, um, only took one hit. And he knew what, because I was tiny enough where. I mean, there, there's a reason why there's only, body. a reason why there's only one Rudy movie. So <laughs> yeah, going to cross country was probably the right yeah. track for you. Uh, what was coach's name again? You, you said Arndt? Uh, Peter Arndt. Peter Arndt, yeah. Retired from Baraboo a couple years ago. He's in the uh, Cross Country Coaches Hall of Fame. Awesome. Up, up here in that. And so um, he convinced me to do it. Um, showed up for a, a, a road race in Baraboo about two weeks before the season began and uh, finished, I think I finished 10th or 11th that year, uh, but was out of high school kids or whatever. I, I was in that one of the, the top kids and uh, it was just the beginning of, of, a, of a friendship between myself and uh, Coach Arndt that, that um, grew and uh, blossomed. And, um, and then, but just from a confidence standpoint, a, a, a young kid who, you know, didn't know, thought he wanted to be a football player because that's everybody else did. And, you know, cross country is this sport where uh, you get picked on because you're a cross country runner, you're not on the football team. And um, so I uh, had a lot of success with it and um, just, learned and grew. And as the years went on, I fell in love with it uh, more and more every year. Um, and uh, just the amount of success I had from that, that then carries over the track and field being a, a distance runner at the time and uh, having the luxury of being able to be coached by uh, some great coaches uh, from coach Boleyn, uh, who is a, a, an amazing man who uh, I'll also help mentor coach Arndt, uh, uh, being able to be coached by uh, Coach Boleyn for a year was fantastic. And then my final two years being able to be coached by Coach Arndt in track and field is where my career like certainly did take off. On the track, were you more of a miler, two miler or more of a half miler, miler? I would, I would say I was probably always a two miler. Hmm. Um, and then um, I ran the mile or I ran the four by eight, hmm. um, depending on what the meet was and that. But my best event always was the two mile, um, but um, I, I was, um, uh, my coach would always laugh is that you're not the quickest, but, but you're consistent. So he always knew what he was going to get week in and week out. So, you, you know, that's actually, that's interesting because that's how they defined me in high school track as well. They said, you're not fast, but you're consistent. The problem was I was consistently slow. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, like I kept going. But, you know, as people were passing me, but I, yeah, I hit the same marks every time. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was kind of similar backgrounds. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us about, you know, coach bowling, coach Arndt. what kind of influence do they have uh, over your high school as your, you know, that's a, it's a big time, right? Middle school through high school. Uh, that's, that's a tough time for a lot of us. I, I got kids that are just now going, uh, getting closest to middle school. Um, and I, you know, I just know what they're going into yep. <laughs> uh, from my own experience. What, what was some of the influence these coaches and really mentors had over you? 
just uh, the the positivity and the the building of your your identity as a as a as a young boy. Those teenage years is where you kind of begin to feel yourself out as to who you want to be and what you want to be. And everybody at that age thinks they're Superman, but we're you know we're not. But um, you know you want to be liked. Um, you want to be in the in crowd. You know you, you just want to be accepted. And they did a really good job on taking my strengths, which, which, which I didn't even see within myself mm. and getting those to come out of me. And uh, coach Bolin was, was huge. And he actually comes back into play my senior year of track and field at our conference championship uh, for track and field. Uh, but he kind of started me on that path and, and coach Arndt was uh, very, very influential. Um, it's, amazing how one person can affect you that much and that relationship and that rapport that coach Arnold um, and, and I build is the reason why I am a, a coach today it's the reason why from a personal standpoint um, coaching is about the masses you know you're, you're going to have in the, the sports that we coach a, a, a lot of athletes and range in such a, a wide variety of talent but the individual aspect and making that that connection is what matters the most. And that's where you're going to get the most from somebody is making that individual connection and um, getting them to, to buy in to what you're doing um, that way. So I, I hear you saying someone who believes in you before you believe in yourself a lot of times that, that they saw yeah. into you before you could actually even yeah. see it. Now you got a little emotional there talking yeah. about, about coach. Um, a lot of times when we think about someone, it means a lot to our lives. There's kind of an instant like story, an example of like, Oh man, when he did X, is, is there a story? I mean, this is obviously, obviously coach Arn is a, is someone deep into your life here. Is there a story that you could share with us that kind of, you know, gives us an example of the, the what he did for you? Um, well, he did one of the things that, uh, my senior year, we, um, middle of the season, having a great year, uh, won my first meet, having a lot of success. And I get to, uh, Mount a Horeb and I wake up and I, I just, I could barely move. And I, you know, we get to the course and I'm get to the bus. And I'm like, all right, it'll be okay. I'll just get there. I get there and I just, I, I can't run. I could barely walk. I just couldn't breathe. My sides hurt. Um, so he took the time to call around to uh, you, you, the W Hospital in Madison to get, get me in to see a specialist. And uh, they found out that I had an, uh, asthma attack. Uh, but it was such a severe asthma attack that it, it caused long-term effect. Wow. Uh, it, it ended up being shorter term than what we originally thought, but he's the one who, 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 who took me down. He's the one who set the appointments up. He's the one who did everything um, and uh, got me in. Um, you know, my parents, of course, paid for everything in that, but he's the one who took the time to make sure everything was right and, and good. And uh, there's so many stories along the, the way that um, just, just the memories that, that we have is, things he, he would do with a track team and, uh, you know, certain runs, the uh, Devil's Lake run, uh, Prefontaine, he would tell the story of Prefontaine as we were going down into Devil's Lake and all that wow. stuff. And uh, the Inagata de Vida road trips, uh, that's, a, that's a song from the past there. We would go out to Devil's Lake to, to run. And uh, I actually take the cross country team now from carol up there every year we're going up sunday and we oh that's cool and run in, in the bluffs and that and just just those connections and just those memories is just fantastic but probably my senior year uh when he took the time to uh get me the assistance was huge being a distance runner sounds like asthma would be a big problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how did you overcome that? Or was it, was it just kind of a temporary ac acute thing or it was, it, was it always there and it just manifested itself that specifically that day? Um, I, we're not sure. I, I know that we ran through a smoke field. Somebody was burning leaves in practice on, on Thursday or whatever. Um, but um, 
the asthmatic specialist just said, hey, you have exercise induced asthma. This could last the rest of your life. Some people grow it. So I did a, I did an inhaler when I woke up in the morning. I did an inhaler when I got on the bus or roughly 20 minutes before we were going to begin our warm up. Um, and then I took one. I always had one in, in case something would develop uh, during a race, or whatever. And then I would take one after I was I was done. And then I would take one at bedtime. So I was on this like wow this regimen, but um, it lasted. I was able to start running again about two weeks later um, and was back at full strength probably a week after that. Oh, good. Yeah. Wow. As you were, you know, we're talking about senior year. So we're starting to turn our eye towards college and maybe running and we'll, we'll learn about that. Before you talk about where running went or did not go in regards to college, where were you in your headspace as far as like, what would you major in? Like, what were you thinking like career wise as a maybe 18 year old high school senior? Um, well, I know I wanted to be um, in the education field, um, be it a teacher, and then I know um, uh, coach, I, I knew I wanted to be a FIA teacher. It was my, my class in school. I, every, every year I got an A and I, I knew I, I, was, I could excel in it and I didn't have to necessarily work <laughs> terribly hard in it to be successful. But um, so I, I knew I wanted to be a FIA teacher, a health um, education usually goes along with that. Um, and then I knew I wanted to be a, a track and cross country coach. Was that based off of your coaches or did you think like this was just the easiest job in the world? Or was it more of just like, <laughs> oh, like these guys could do it. Like, I, I want to honor them. Like, I, I want to be them. Yeah. Um, my, my mom always wanted to be a school teacher, I think. And so um, I always wanted to be a, a teacher of some sort. Um, and then through um, my track at cross country experiences, you know, my FIA teacher and my health education teacher were my track coaches. Um, you know, my uh, uh, main uh, track coaches, uh, Coach Art, then was cross country, and then my distance coach. But just the influence and the the the, the great relationships that I had, I, I knew that was something that I wanted to pursue, and uh, saw saw in them like, hey, I that is something I can do. And I, I think it would be something I would be successful at. Um, and so I uh, continued on. I chose Carroll uh, Carol College at the time um, as to uh, that's, where, that's where I wanted to go. Oh, dude, I, I will always say this. So you're an alum of Carroll University, Carroll College yes. back then. Yes. I always have a soft place in my heart for alums who coach at their alma mater. Uh, I always think about, yeah, I coached at my alma mater for a small time, Troy University. I don't know if anybody's ever heard me that I actually graduated from Troy University. I, I only say that every show, Sean. Um, <laughs> but like, to me, it's like when you're recruiting, when, you, when you're when you at your alma mater, it's like, you know, I'm telling you how great my school is. And, and you know how I can prove it? Like, I went to school here. That's how much I believe yep. in the school. It's like, this yep. isn't just a job. Like, this is where I grew up yep. this <laughs> so is where I, I call home yeah i love that that's awesome so you go to carroll did you yep. start as a physical education major or what, what did you start out as yep phi ed uh was my major uh health education was my minor um and um i um came to carroll i you know i ended up running cross country my i ran cross country all four years um i ran indoor track for three and outdoor track for two um, I just, it's something about cross country. I, I just loved and, uh, just continued with it, uh, educational side of things and that, and, um, I just found, the the relationship with track wasn't as strong anymore. Uh, but that relationship with cross country was, um, I, I knew all along that I wanted to be a high school track coach and a high school cross country coach. Um, and, um, you know, Pam Pinus Schultz, who was my, uh, one of my phi ed professors and who uh, assisted me with my registration for classes in that, you know, there, there was a, a track and field cross country co coaches class at the time. And she goes, Sean, you don't need to take that. I'm like, well, everybody else is, what do you, what do you mean? She goes, well, if you want an easy grade, sure, go ahead. But it, it's, that's not going to get you the job. It's your experiences that you have. That's what's going to get you the job. And so learning while you're an athlete and watching the little things and going, you know, what's going on behind the scenes that you're able to talk to your coach about, that's where you're going to gain the most. So, so in the track season, one of my favorite meets to go to is a conference meet. 
because of the complete buy-in from the team uh, and specifically depending on the, on the level of conference, but, you know, someone who is maybe not a national class athlete, you know, going on to the NCAA or NAIA national championships, but they can contribute to a team. They can grab that eighth place in the high jump or eighth in the uh, shot put and contribute to the team title, whether they win for a second, third, but that's like almost the only meet of the year that we have that right. But cross country, is all uh, I'll say it's always team scored. I'm pretty sure that's true, right? Yep. Now that I think yes, about it, I had to think about <laughs> non cross country guy to think about. Wait a minute, are there meets? Uh, so talk about because you mentioned, you know, cross country had that atmosphere relationship. I think is the word you used, and you didn't have that as much on the track side. What is it about cross country? Is it the team scoring atmosphere or is it the, you know, it's five people only <laughs> uh, versus track is, you know, could be 35 people yeah. are scoring. Well, what's the difference there? And, and maybe most importantly, take that in one step further. What are some things that we can learn from cross country to put into our quote unquote regular season of track that we, we can have that because track is a great sport. It's the best sport. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. It even is. Over cross. I love cross, but track is the best sport. How do we get that relationship for every meet, not just one or two meets a year? Um, well, we've, we've, we've worked on that here. And I, I think cross country, the, the unique of cross country is that everybody's trying to accomplish the same goal. They're all trying to run the same distance. So though we have individual goals, our training is going to be consistent. We're together six, seven days a week. We're, we're, we're logging miles we're logging our runs 40 minute runs and so you really really get to know your teammates mm -hmm. that's your entertainment that's your closest friends on campus that's who you're going to probably room with that's going to be the friend the rest of your life and just that uniqueness and those bonds that that you form and um i think is what makes cross country unique and i think that's why a lot of coaches will say like with, with me, with other coaches in the department, like, Hey, when you see one, you see two or you see three, like, yeah, because they're, they're, they're together. And then you add track into it. And then these athletes carry over and these athletes are together from August 18th until potentially Memorial day weekend. And there's just that mid semester break between first and second semester for a couple of weeks uh, while they're back home that they're away from each other. And so I think that's what creates just that, that commitment to each other and um, how it, it has that family feel. And it, it has that you're out for the person next to you. You know, we always say with track and cross country, the most important person on the team is the person on your left and the person on your right. Oh, nice. It's never you. It's always the person on your left, the person on your right. That's, that's why we're there. That's what's, they're the ones who are going to get the most out of you. I'm going to say, hey, here's our plan of what we're going to do, but they're the ones who are going to make that plan grow. They're the ones who are going to throw in the, you know, a little bit of spice here and a little bit of spice there. And in the end, you know, hopefully it's a, it's a, it's a perfect cake or, you know, steak dinner or whatever you, you prefer. But, um, you know, I give them the meat and potatoes. Hey, here's what we need to do. But they add in the, the side dishes and the things, you know, and that that makes the teammates are the ones who make it unique. And carrying that over to, 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 to track is getting all those different event groups because mm -hmm. you're broken up into event groups. You got a sprint coach, jumps coach, you know, you're, you're in all different. And A, getting those groups to buy into that same format within that group. And if you can get those individual groups to buy into that, um, and that assistant coach to grow that atmosphere within those groups, it's easy then to connect the dots, to connect throwers with the jumpers, distance, you know, all that stuff. So when you're at a practice, when you're at meets, there's a relationship and there, there's a bond. There's that camaraderie in practice where the sprinters think the distance runners are, are, are absolute weirdos because they run so much with no rest. Um, the, the distance kids think the sprinters have it easy because they run so short, so quick, but they have a ton of rest. Um, and then the, you know, the throwers and jumpers just kind of, you know, they'll, they'll chime in. And I think that's what we've done really well here at Carroll is to form those bonds between those event groups and get the event coaches to buy into that philosophy. And that it makes a world of difference. And, that's what makes those meets fun, those ones leading up to it, because then 
uh, those athletes know, your teammates know, hey, you're fighting to be on that conference roster. So, hey, we're going to finding out, hey, what do you need to do? And it's funny for track, we'll be at meets, first meets of the year, and kids will be like, hey, coach, is that enough to get me on that conference roster? Because I want to get there. And I'm like, hey, yeah, looks like it. But we still got a long way to go. But, you know, and getting them to buy into that, um, that friendly competitiveness is key. And getting that motivation from from the person on your left and your right is huge. Using your food analogy, you know, the track team is kind of like a, a full day's menu. So the throwers are the breakfast and the, the you know, I'm going to run out of meals here, but you know, every, <laughs> it, it, it's everyone's different. It's how do you bring that together so they can see your whole diet is important, yep. not just any one meal The you know, the distance runners aren't the most important part. The throwers aren't the most, like it, it takes an amalgamation of every one of those events. And that's the hardest part. Cause you can't, you know, using that food analogy, you're talking about the size and, and things. I like, thank goodness I already had lunch. Cause I'd be, <laughs> I'd, I'd have to cut this short and go eat this. Is, uh, we're going to talk more food than I thought here today. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, the throwers can't do the same practice or the same time in the same locations as the distance runners, the sprinters can't necessarily maybe do the same as the pole vaulters and jumpers and yep. things like that. So it's, it's, it's uh, what a tough job for a coach and a coaching staff to sell the, Hey, we're, we're running for Carol or Carol track and field, Carol uh, track and field uh, team, not the distance squad and the throw squad and the jump. Yep. That's such a hard part. Um, like maybe no other sport, you know, even football still, you know, all the different positions, they still come together to have the offense and the defense and yep. uh, that kind of team camaraderie. Uh, well, let's, let's get back to the track. So you're running through college, you're studying physical education. You just know you're going to be a teacher and a, and a track coach. So how's it going as you go through seeing, you know, move along to senior year? Uh, going well. Um, I started through my field experience up at Waukesha North to kind of um, in the FIED areas, I, I met uh, Chuck Bova, and uh, Chuck Bova was the head track coach up there at the time. And I just said, "Hey, coach, I and I know you don't know me from the the person sitting next to you, but you know, I, a young college man who would be interested in being a volunteer coach after I'm done with my, uh, you know, all my competitions in college. I would certainly like to get into it." Um, and uh, he introduced me to Don Zarapata and. Uh, Coach Zarapata was the men's cross country coach at Waukesha North. And so in the fall of 96, uh, I started uh, coaching cross country at Waukesha North as a volunteer coach um, and uh, coached there for two years as a volunteer. Um, and Coach Zarapata was great. He was towards the end of his career. Um, so um, he actually retired my second year. Um, and hopefully I was going to take on that, that position, uh, didn't quite work out that way, but, um, uh, it was just great to have him it's just the knowledge, the language, the resources of workouts, um, is, was, was awesome. Um, and, uh, was a, a, a big, uh, a big person in my beginning of being a, a coach, a uh, great person to be coaching on under. Uh, for my first time. Sometimes we're in our beginning of our coaching journey when it's volunteer coaching and things like that. We don't really know if we're going to be a coach. Like we don't know, is this, you know, we can't see 20 years down the line. It's like, yep. Okay. That's my career. You seem pretty clear from early, even in to high school that, yeah, I'm going to be a coach. Maybe you didn't know it was going to be college, you know, kind of yeah. mainly thick in high school, but at this stage, so your early stage, you already know like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So were you taking, taking advantage of the situation? Meaning as coach was giving workouts, were you asking questions like, Hey, so coach, so why'd you do this? Here's what my college coach did. This seems a little different. Were you going like reactively searching for the reason of why the workouts were, or were you, was it more of just follow the pack? Okay. He said 10 by one mile. So that's what we're going to do today. And I won't ask why we're just going to do it. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the beginning. Yeah. It was kind of like, Hey, I just about volunteer. I, you know, my input, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring as much to the table as coach wants me to bring and try to, you know, respect that. Um, it is his program and that, and i um, trying to build that rapport. And as we built that rapport, he opened the door more for me to actually plan workouts and to do things like, Hey, here's what I've got, uh, you know, on, on bus trips home from meets, whatever, here's what I've got for next week, or, you know, kind of laid out 
uh, what are your thoughts? And so I would begin to um, give thoughts and uh, give input. And, um, you know, that second year, it was a, a pretty good split of communication and uh, taking what coach wanted to do, some of my ideas and things like that, and just kind of blending them uh, together. And now, how long had, had he coached for at this point? Uh, this was my second cross country season. No, no. How long had he been coaching? Oh, he, oh gosh, Coach Serapata. He was retiring from teaching and he, 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 he had seen many of seasons and heard a lot of guns go off. <laughs> uh, so that's interesting that he could have the, I'm going to use the word humility, the humility to listen. I mean, you're a, you're a long, young whippersnapper at yeah. this point. You're two years out of college. Don't matter how, I don't care if you were a, 20 million times college All-American. You're still right out of college. This guy's been doing it forever and I assumably had success uh, through it as well. But he had the foresight to kind of like, okay, Sean, let's let's hear your ideas and even implemented some of those. That had to make you feel like empowered, like, oh man, maybe I am on the right track here. Yeah, it, it certainly helped. Um, you know, he came up to the middle of the second year and said, hey, you know what? I'm, this is it. This is my last year. I'm, you know, I've, I've done it enough. I've seen enough. I, I know when to get out and I, and I know that you're the right person to take it on. And, um, and so that's when he kind of let me um, add more and build more and kind of, I guess, give a little bit of a, a coaching interview type of say. And I know he didn't have the say, but he would, his voice would certainly speak loud enough with the administration at Waukesha North. Um, and um so uh, he found a way to get me paid the second year. We had a young man, uh, Peter, who was autistic, um, and we couldn't let Peter race by himself. So myself and another assistant coach would take turns in races. So I would take one race, he'd take the next, and we couldn't, we could say rabbit and we could say turtle. When we needed to go faster, we would tell Peter we needed to be a rabbit. Huh. So Peter then knew that he had to go faster. We could never lead or anything. We always had to run beside him or like kind of like right behind him to make sure that he was going in the right paths and that. Uh, but that was a lot of fun too, seeing that uniqueness of it, working with that type of athlete. Um, though I was working with everybody, uh, he was able to get me paid through the school district uh, that way uh, my second year. That, that's super interesting. Uh, the, the rabbit and... Um turtle like how, how to help someone else achieve success what i'm reminded of you see the uh um i don't know what their technical name is i'll call them pacers but like the sprinters like the um like in the paralympics and stuff where they're yep. blind and they have a sprinter who's you know got like this i mean it looks like it's a three inch <laughs> string and they're in perfectly sync with the athlete to help them you know get the hundred yep. get, get down the hundred and that it's just like it blows my mind, like the amount of coordination, the amount of trust, the amount of practice. It, to me, it's like a whole different, like watching someone run 980, with, you know, with the, the, the Italian guy who just won the Olympics. Like, that's amazing. Like, that's wow, fast 980. Yeah. Watching someone run, I don't even know what these guys run, 1080, 1180, doesn't matter. They're all out with a, a, a pacer so that they can get that. That is just like, the most mind blowing thing in the world. So I, I love the, the uniquenesses of coaching different people in yep. different abilities. So that, that's awesome. Wow. So you just turtle and like, did you ever be like, Hey man, can, can you uh, rabbit? Like, can, can you go faster? <laughs> like like you're, you're yelling rabbit. And he's like, look, bro, <laughs> like uh, I, I got no, no rabbit in my legs. You can yell it all you want. We stand right here. <laughs> Peter, Peter was awesome. Peter had a great sense of humor. Uh, we'd be in a, in a big, this discussion coach Serapata would be going over things and all of a sudden Peter would just say something. And um, coach knew at that point that um, basically that, that was his mark of, all right, I've talked long enough. Now we just need to move on to the next thing. And so uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Peter brought a, a great uh, uh, uniqueness to the North cross country team. I, That's my awesome. last year there and just, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And uh those guys there um, and the ladies team, it was great to uh, be able to look back on those days and just uh, laugh now and smile and all that stuff. So, so you're building up, you interviewed with coach and he's helping you out and he's got a lot of influence, but you, you kind of, you're alluding to that. It, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> it, it didn't work out. They wanted, um, 
they wanted a teacher in the building because coach Zarapata was at a grade school down the road. So they wanted a teacher in the building. The funny thing was, was that this teacher in the building was the assistant cross country coach at Waukesha West across town. Oh, that, that seems uh, like a problem. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it was, it, it's, uh, and this is where um, Matt Eshi kind of comes in as you've interviewed uh, Matt before. And Matt was a young man that I, I had the privilege of being able to coach. So um, at Matt's, and Matt did touch on this, that Tony Brolic, his high school cross country coach, passed away at the conference championship meet in cross country. Mm -hmm. And that was my last year at North and with Coach um, Zarapata. So when that sad event really took place, it changed that. Um, that assistant coach then wanted to go back to North and begin his own uh, program there. And so um, I interviewed and he interviewed and uh, of, of course, the, you know, he, he, he fit their pro, you know, not, I shouldn't say profile, I apologize, but mm -hmm. he fit the job description better. Mm -hmm. And um, so he certainly got the job and I went up to him as soon as he got it. And I congratulated him uh, in person and, uh, told him that, hey, I've been here the last couple of years. I'd be more than um, happy to continue to be an assistant coach underneath you. Um, and it's kind of where, where I left it. Um, and about six weeks later, I get a call from a, uh, a great coach by the name of Al Sapa. Uh, Al was the head track coach at Waukesha West with the men's program and uh, then took on the cross country a head coaching position. So him and coach Zarapata were extremely tight, really, really good friends. And so coach Zarapata, when uh, coach Sapa reached out to him and asked him, uh, Hey, I, I have a coaching vacancy. You know, I'm the new I'm taking over the cross country coaching position at West. Um, do you know of anybody who would be a great assistant coach? And so um uh, Coach Zarapata mentioned my name and uh, Coach Sapa called me and uh, we interviewed and he he offered me the job. But once again, I was very respectful. And I told Coach Sapa, I said, hey, I, I I would love to get the position. I called Coach Arndt back home and we've had our communication about, you know, this is kind of the first step in really becoming a, a true assistant coach. Um, and I wanted to give the Waukesha North program that option yet because that's where I started to like, Hey, I just want to know, cause I haven't heard anything. And he said, Sean, I still don't know yet. And I said, all right, well, I just want to let you know that I'm going to accept the assistant coach position at Waukesha West, which was both track and cross country, which is what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, funny story is about two weeks after that, that teacher then uh, stepped down as the cross country coach. And one of my good friends who became one of my really good friends ended up becoming the head coach at Waukesha North. Oh, wow. So what were you doing? Cause we're post college now. What are you yep. doing like to actually make money here? It doesn't sound like you're teaching. No, I was a aide in the school district for kids that were cognitively disabled. My experience okay. with Peter um, mm -hmm. really uh, brought out a, a different side that I, I wanted to kind of look at and to go into. And so um, I got into the school district as a CD aide. I was a one-on-one -on -one aide uh, for uh, a, a fifth grader. Um, that's also through this fifth grader is actually where I met my wife and now wife. And so it's just funny how everything just connects together and the, the, you know, it's a big puzzle and there's so many pieces. It's just funny how everything just laid out within a two year stretch. That was just amazing. That's a really good analogy that I haven't heard yet. When you said puzzle, like it made me think about like all the, like you got this puzzle that's incomplete in front of you, right? Cause it's never complete until we're, we're done until we shuffle off this mortal yeah. coil. Right. And so as your life goes along, you find these pieces that fit, you know, the, the right position. Now I'm going to be the assistant coach for track and cross country over here. And that what we forget sometimes is that affects other people's puzzles. Yep. So that person steps down and another person's puzzle piece comes in and they become the coach and you guys become friends. And uh, you have this guy, Peter, there's a little bit of a puzzle piece and you find like this passion of like, Oh, wait a minute. Like I like 
this kind of individual attention and helping other people with disadvantages and you go become an aide uh, for a fifth grader and you meet your wife. That's a big puzzle piece, by the way. <laughs> They're not all <laughs> the in same. That, uh, it's in that heart shaped puzzle piece. I think yeah, that yeah. one is when the wife comes in. This puzzle does not have the equal sized pieces. That's right. <laughs> Some are bigger than others. And so you find this big piece, the wife. That's so cool. That's interesting. So how did it go? You got what you wanted. You wanted to be cross country and track. Yep. How did that first season go there? Uh, it was awesome. When you have gentlemen by the name of Matt Eshe, by Dan Humstrail, Bill Walkowitz, uh, Tim Daly, uh, uh, who am I, Chris Martin, um, you just there's this plethora of talent. These young men took one conference. They were, I think that, that was year. I think they were either fifth or third. I can't remember. I'm, I'm sure Matt and the 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 gentlemen are going to remind me after yeah, they, they're, they're yelling at. They're listening right now and they're <laughs> yelling at you like, how could you forget? <laughs> um, but yeah, they just come off a of really successful. And so uh, just coming in, I, I you know Dan. Uh, Dan was the middle distance runner. Chris Martin was the middle distance guy. Uh, Matt Eshe was the long distance guy. Bill Walkowitz could go from the eight on up to eight to two mile, depending on what. Uh, you know, what we needed. Um, and so it was just fun to be able to work with that 800 group, the mile group and the two mile group. But then Coach Zarapata then came on board too. So it was Coach, Coach Sapa, myself and Coach Zarapata. We coached both sports. The wow. So Coach Zarapata coached that four, eight group. He kind of took it over after that year. Um, and so just, um, just to be able to work with athletes of that talent, um, you know, that went on a, 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 a school record holders in high school, state champions in high school, division one athletes who got scholarships, walk on division one athletes, uh, just they went on for national championships in college, just to work with talent like that to be your first job is really, really fortunate <laughs> on my behalf. Yeah, we don't get, and, uh, especially in high school, we don't always get that number, right? Sometimes you'll have yeah. one really good athlete and maybe a couple of decent ones. You had a, a plethora there at, at of all those guys. And, and those guys are legends at that school because of what they did and how they did it. Which one was your favorite and why was it Matt Eshi? Um, because <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt reminded me a lot of, uh, of me. He, he was a, he was a kid who was eager and as he got to know his talent and see some of it he could see how high the ceiling potentially was and with Matt it was a lot of fun because I took a lot of what coach Arndt did with me and worked with with Matt I my favorite workout with Matt Eshi and Matt never forgets this workout he reminds me every time he sees me is we're doing 400 repeats and we're doing two mile race pace Matt had never broken 10 minutes up to that point well, Matt starts running 400 repeats faster than 10 minutes. Well, Chris Martin had already broken 10 minutes. So Chris was running faster. And I'm like, Matt, what are you doing? Well, I'm running I'm like, no, your workout says you run this time. You've only raced this fast. You cannot run faster than this. You haven't broken 10 minutes. You can't go that fast. So the next race, Matt decides to crush the 10 minute barrier. He turns to, as soon as he's done, he turns to me and he goes, 10 minute barrier coach. And you know, <laughs> knowing Matt well enough and shout out to you, Matt, because I know you're listening, buddy. Uh, and we become real dear friends that like, I could have made up that story to that T because that's him. He, you challenge him, boy, he yep. steps up, man. Yep. So that's, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And so Matt was a lot of fun. All those guys were, were great because they were really, really close friends. They, mm -hmm. they were competitive against each other, but they were, uh, very close friends and me fresh out of college, I was still living in a fraternity house. So mm. I was the cool guy because I was in a fraternity house. So these guys, uh, you know, we grew very close. Uh, we would go um, camping, you know, we'd go up to Devil's Lake. I, I would take a, a group uh, up to Devil's Lake to go camping and uh, just spend some, spend some time with them once again, to build that camaraderie. Um, and, you know, I would take a group of about 10 athletes and, you know, friends and, you know, that stuff. And, uh, we just go up and just, just to get away from it and mm -hmm. just to grow and mature and build that camaraderie. And it ended up bringing us, I would like to think, uh, uh, part of it 
into the, you know, the state championship that we had in cross country. Uh, that's Matt's junior year and those guys junior year. And, um, you know, we were third, our first year in cross first, and then we ended up fifth, I think our last year of that group, that core group was together, but, and then you go to the track side of things and, you know, we had a, a four by four that won state and it was the same team that won the four by eight title. And, uh, we, we had a wide receiver from the football team that coach Zarapata converted in, into a 400 runner and a half miler. Wow. Jake Peterson, un, unbelievable talent. You watch him run and you're like, he's not running that fast. Jake, come on, you got it. And then you look at your watch and you're like, holy smokes, Jake's moving. And, uh, you know, we had uh, Dan Hunt's child who could have been an individual state champ. And he goes, no, coach, the, it's, it's all about these guys. I, I want to win one for these guys this year. And then next year, my senior year, that, then I'll, I'll chase the individual title. And Dan certainly did. He won an individual title his senior year. You know, it's every coach's dream. How do you recreate that attitude with the talent, right? Like, Yep. Come on, man. That's amazing. Yep. Well, Self-sacrifice. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you didn't stay there forever. So how long were you there and where, where'd you go to next? Uh, I was there for four track seasons and four cross country seasons. Um, and then um, I went, I started in Carroll in January of 02. I came back to Carroll in 02. Um, and uh, Nate Daney, my really good friend, in college, who I went to college with, was an admissions counselor here, and Dr. Jane Hopp was the athletic director, and uh, Todd Carter was the head track coach, and um, it was a, a program that had seen a lot of turnover from the head coach's department, had a new athletic director, uh, newer president, um, and so they made some changes within the athletic department before I got here, um, and um, I came in at the end of it, and um, funny, when I interviewed, um, I interviewed with Coach Carter for the track position. Um, and he's like, yep, it's yours. Don't worry about it. You've got it pretty much. Um, and then I met with Dr. Dr. Hopp, the athletic director, and Chris Jacobson, the assistant athletic director. And um, it was a unique interview, one I've never had before. But it, it, now when I look back on it, I understand what she was doing. As Dr. Hopp goes at the end, she goes, okay. I'd like to offer you the position, but I'm not going to. I'm like, well, what do you mean? She goes, I want you to be, I want to know if you're a Carroll person. Because I went there under the old coaching staff and under the old athletic director and all that. And now it was a different, uh, they had a, a different goals and you know the, the ship was pointed in a different direction and it looked differently than you know when we were here. And she wanted to make sure that, that, that I was coming in um, with my own ideas and not trying to bring in what, you know, like, Hey, I want to get in because so-and-so got fired. So I, I can keep that going. And I told her, I said, glad they will. Um, but why I'm here is because it's what I want to do. This is, I want to be different than what was here before. And I want to make my own mark. And I, I want to show things to, that can be done here. Um, and, uh, coach Mobley, Rick Mobley at the time, he just goes, Hey, Sean, you're a, you're a Carol guy. Don't worry about it. He goes, don't worry about it. You're a Carol guy. We could see it, but just, I'm like, okay, no problem. I, mean, I have no problem. And then, uh, Dr. Hop then stepped down as an AD and, uh, Chris Jacobson took it over. Um, and, uh, Chris is one of her first things she did was she came up to me and said, Hey, congratulations. You're the head cross country coach. So. Was this for head cross and head track? Uh, no, I, I was an assistant track coach, head cross country coach. So was the plan always, and maybe not even always, but during that time as you're continuing to coach through high school, was the plan to move to coach college or was it really, okay, I'm just going to coach high school, um, but then, you know, maybe something special opens up and the alma mater being opened up is kind of special. Yeah. So uh, what, what was the plan to that that ultimately got you to Carroll? The, the plan, um, Coach Sapp and I had sat down and we had talked and, you know, I felt that I, I was getting ready to uh, hopefully be able to, and we had discussions about, he was going to be the head track, I would be the head cross country coach, and then he'd be my assistant, I'd be his assistant. Uh, but he, he loved it so much. He was a track guy, he had not coached cross country before, but he loved it so much that he just says, no, I'm, I'm not ready to step away yet. And I said, that's fine. And I, I talked with coach Zarapata and 
he just said, hey, Sean, um, if you, if you want to go to Carroll, go. Coach Sapa will support you, and I will support you, and we think it's a great move for you. And uh, Randy Dahl, the athletic director at Waukesha West at the time, I sat down with him, and um, I just talked to him about, hey, um, you know, you're an athletic director. You've been around athletics a long time, and you kind of know who I am and what, you know, what I want to get to and what I want to accomplish. And he too encouraged me to, to pursue the um, goal here of getting at Carroll if that position was open and they were really willing to give me that shot. And, uh, and so I, uh, with Coach Tappa's blessing and Coach Zarapata's blessing, I took the step over um, to uh, um, five minutes across town <laughs> to Carroll University, I guess, and Carroll College at the time. But uh, yeah, it was just, my name uh, had been floated around before within the coaching ranks of the alumni who were coaching it in high school because they knew the job was opening and that Carroll wanted somebody uh, local or, you know, who had been an alum or, you know, something like that. And so my name was floated around a, a bit. I would hear people come up to me and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I haven't been reached out to or anything. Um, and so, uh, when, um, uh, my friend Nate reached out to me and said, Hey, I, I, I think you would fit really well. And, um, I, I can put in a good word for you if you want to, I said, sure, let's, let's go after it. And with my, uh, wife at the time, we, we sat and talked and knew it would be, uh, I would still work in the district, but I would coach at Carroll because it was a part-time thing. So, mm, okay. What, so I'm a big advocate that if the, if it fits high school coaches could also like they should be considered for college coaching as well. And there's um, some myths and, and maybe some truths as well as to why maybe they don't fit um, a, a lot of times, right? Cause most of the time it's, it's a college coach going to another college coaching position or an athlete going into coaching. What were taking over a program, even though this was a part-time position, you're still the head coach of the cross country team. So that means there's a budget, there's a schedule, there's team rules. There's obviously the training aspect, there's recruiting, et cetera. Coming from the high school level, what were, what advantages do you think you had coming into a head coaching job on the coaching level? Um, you knew the the high school environment at the time and what what was a hot at the time and you know names and coaches of who to get to right away as you make that transition or knew the the programs that were uh, excuse me um, some of the better programs or you know who the individuals were because uh, having the 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 the, the the great teams that we did of being able to be at that, that, that state level every year, or one of those top teams, you kind of saw the same teams or those same programs that were there every year. And so you, you knew that if you could get athletes from those programs, that those would be the foundation blocks that those were kids coming in who knew what it took uh, to make a program uh, be successful for, for the long term. They have been in something like that. And I think that's what, helped me out was being able to reach out and feel comfortable making some of those phone calls to, to coaches who I just talked to at a, at a state meet, or I just talked to or, or seen a couple of weeks before just saying, Hey, uh, just calling, you know, I just took the job at Carroll would love to talk to you about athletes that you have, or, you know, ideas from a, a training standpoint that your team does and that, and just kind of open that door to, uh, help them, I, I guess, feel like they have a voice too. And if their athletes are going, going, going to come here. I believe if you're doing life right, you're always improving. You know, you ever seen that, you know, improve 1% a day type yeah. of thing, you know? Um, so what were, I asked you what your advantages were, and those made a lot of sense. What were some of the, uh, we had coach Carrie Lane on the podcast <laughs> and she talked about her, oh crap coaching, like, oh crap, I just signed the number one javelin thrower. I better learn how to coach the javelin. Yeah. What were some of your, I don't want to, I'm going to use the terrible term disadvantages going in. So things that you just didn't have the experience in because you were a high school coach and a college athlete. What were some of the things that you had your oh crap moments? Like, oh, I've got to set a schedule or, or whatever. What were those kind of things that you had to really learn and improve yourself as a coach coming into your first coaching gig? Uh, pretty much the same thing in your regular life budget. 
Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, being an assistant, that head coach does a lot of administrative things that you don't see, or you, you know, or don't, you may see, but you don't have to do. And so when the athletic director comes in and says, I need a budget report. And I look at him like, or look at her like, well, what are you talking about? I, 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 I don't know. This is what my schedule looks like. I don't know what a bus caught. I, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm getting there. I just know this is where we're going. Um, so just, just learning that, like just the administrative side of things and just uh, the amount of gray hairs that just the administrative side of things brings that, you know, it's like, you got to separate the, you know, the, the real world that the athletes see away from that and try not to bring that over into that, that real world. When an athletic director tells you, no, you can't do that, mm -hmm. but you know, and it, it, it just that, that's, just those small things that you don't see or that your eyes may not pay that much attention to um, is that, and then just, um, you know, the other disadvantage, always being a new coach, you're always compared to the coach before. Well, this is what this coach did. This is what that coach did. And being able then to say, well, here's what I've done. Here's how athletes in this program have progressed in the past. Well, coach, that was a 5k. I run a 10k or coach, I'm this runner, you know, and it's like, all right, I, I, I get it. It'll all make sense, but let's break it down with you. And I'll set up time to meet with you in that. And just, just getting that side of thing of being humble enough to know that you don't have all the answers, I guess, is, you know, just getting that through your head that you don't have all the answers and that you're never going to make everybody happy. You just have to do what you feel is right and what you feel is right for your program in the direction that you want to know that you want to go. But the main disadvantage is just that the uniqueness of the NCAA versus the WIA from a rules standpoint um, and from how important, how much emphasis is on the budget. What were some leaders or mentors that were helping you now at this instant? So when you had to do a budget report or set a schedule or figure out if you wanted to recruit these kids or these kids, was there some people that you leaned on of like, Hey man, help me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rick Mobley, who was the soccer coach here, I had mentioned before another great person that I met is Roger Haynes from Monmouth college. Oh yeah. I love Roger. Yeah. And uh, Roger was very welcoming to me. I, you know, as track goes that senior class, my second year here at Carroll, I was promoted to the, the co-head coach in track. And then coach Carter was relieved of his duties after the indoor season. So then I was the head coach in my second year here. Um, and coach Carter was our throws coach. So now I don't have a throws coach. Um, and so, uh, but coach Haynes was awesome. And he still is to this day, a very close friend of mine. And we, we, we chat and we text and, you know, we still travel down to Monmouth every year because of the relationship uh, that, that, that I I've, I've got with him and that. And, um, but Roger was big into, um, building my confidence as a coach when we were at meets and that, and just like, Hey, we're all going to make mistakes. There's going to be things that tomorrow you're going to regret or down the road, you're going to regret, but, uh, you're, you're doing the right things. Um, and, um, coach art, uh, once again, going back to, uh, relying on him a little bit and continuing to reach out to him. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, those were the, the two big ones, uh, coach zero pot. I'd reach out to, uh, sometimes in that, um, uh, but just, um, you know, you coaches, you looked up to, you know, you have coach Rick Witt who had been around for a while and I had seen it when I was at Baraboo in high school and he was at point and that you just, you go to these meets and you, you see these names and uh, of coaches and, you know, uh, Deb and John up at uh, UW Oshkosh and Guthrie up at lacrosse and you, you know, all these names and you get there and you're like, they're, I'm at the same level as them. Hold on here. Something's not right. Time out here. I, I don't belong here. And so just, you know, and you always want to emulate the, the best of the best, but you, you can, but you still have to do it your own way. I, I, I don't, I don't even know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, it's great. Okay. It, it, it's interesting. You know, uh, there's a lot of assistant coaches out there that think they want to become a head coach. Uh, I'm always extremely impressed with assistant coaches who realize I don't want to be the head coach. It's like, I'm good being an assistant coach. Yep. You mentioned in your second year, you become the head coach. And with that comes 
every not just a season of cross country now it's seasons of indoor and outdoor uh the buck stops here yep. <laughs> uh now you you know going back to our discussion about you know throwers and jumpers and distance now you have to be the cohesive leader over all of yeah. those different groups so what was it like your second year you're still this is a still relatively young in your career yeah. you know this isn't 10 15 20 years into a coaching career this is within t- the 10 years of graduating yeah what not, was not it? even 30 yet yeah yeah <laughs> so what was it like what, what was your oh crap moment of like hey uh okay so you're no longer the co-head coach you are the head coach and you have no throws coach by the way um yeah. good luck what was your yeah. Like, what was your first immediate, like, okay, I know I have to do this. I know I have to bring the team together. Hmm. Uh, the, you know, coach Carter was, was, was great. He was, um, he was the football coach hmm. and uh, who, who was put in a position at, at, to oversee track, uh, but um, ended up having to take it over because of something that had previously happened with the coach before and never wanted to be in that position. Mm-hmm. That, that's so, a good distinction. I like how you put that. He was there to oversee the track team. He was not there to be the head coach. I'm adding the words to it now at this yep. point, but he wasn't, he wasn't there because he's like, oh yeah, I love track and I want to coach and mentor these young men and women. It was like, yeah, okay, we, we need a Band-Aid and that's not yep. always a bad thing, but we need someone to oversee it. Yeah, yeah, great, great yep. distinction there. And so he, he, he was doing something that, you know, wasn't his passion, wasn't his love. And so uh, he was excited um, about me being able to take it over, though it meant him being removed from the, uni- you know, the university, but he was excited for me to being able to take it over. And we actually are still really good friends. And um, he says the best thing he ever did at Carroll was to bring me on as his assistant coach. Um, awesome. So, um, but um just bringing the team together, this senior class with me, my second year as their head coach, I had four head coaches in four years. Mm. And so just bringing that around and uh, bringing that team together and trying to get those seniors who this was their last hurrah. And now it just was like in upheaval. You know, thankfully I had the year before to build a relationship with. Um, and as the assistant coach, everybody wants to talk to you. But once you become the head coach, Nobody wants to talk to you anymore. I started looking around at meets and I go to the distance kids. I'm like, why does nobody talk to me anymore? They're like, coach, because you're the head coach. You're the crabby guy now. I'm like, what the? Last year, everybody wanted to talk to me. I couldn't get away from anybody. And the bleachers, I have like six people. Now I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. And so it's just trying to rally that, that group and still give them things that they deserve. I remember taking... Our four by one squad, um, as that was a great group of young ladies, um, a 10K runner um, down to Drake that year mm. and still giving them that experience. And uh, they took a picture of me. They said it was my birthday and I got all these balloons and all that stuff. And, you know, and uh, just having that because that was something that they they really wanted to do and were really looking forward to. So make sure that that group was still able to have that experience because that was something that they were really looking forward to be able to do and to get them to get there uh, was huge. And I I think that was a a huge growing moment for me as a coach and being accepted by everybody uh, was that. um, And so um, also getting kicked out of a uh, conference track meet isn't a bad start either. So you did or the team? I did. What did you do? (laughs) That was my first year. Second, so my first year as a full year, uh, we're at the indoor conference meet, and we had, our men's team had scored one point, oh. and we're in the four by four, and John Mahoney is coming around the back stretch. He's finished. We took eighth. Hey, we got our second point. Awesome. I'm walking down the back stretch, and the the officials name who I will not name, um, uh, who we actually became good friends after the, after this. Um, I was coach, I just want to let you know that your, your four by four team just got disqualified. I'm like, what? How are we disqualified? Well, an official said that your runner and Pete, I said, whoa, 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 wait. I said, we don't have any officials on the back stretch. So where is this coming from? What, what's going on? This is, and he goes, well, the official said your team impeded Knox College. 
nope, you're getting DQ'd. And then um, I was very loudly cordial. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, wait a minute. Uh, we already know you got kicked out. <laughs> loudly, loudly cordial as to like, what are you doing? You, you, you can't make that call. As when we met as coaches, we, we specifically said there were no officials on the backstretch. How can you make that call saying an official? So, um, so I asked him, did you see it? He said, no, I had an official come up and tell me. I'm like, well, then you can't make that call. And um, so now we're kind of getting a little bit further apart. <laughs> But, but still loud but still, enough to hear. <laughs> yeah, still loud enough for to hear. And uh, I go, uh, I go, you can't make that call. And then he goes, yes, I am. And your team's DQ'd. And I, and I said, you're an embarrassment to this conference right now because he tried DQing the, the Beloit four by two team the night before because they didn't follow the NCAA rules. And we're like, no, our, conference rules come first so he tried and so there was already this and the other other coaches had been getting on him all day and all weekend i was just the one was just the the one that tipped him over the edge i guess you were the match into the gasoline yes you were the yes. okay poof, the powder of keg and i said this is an embarrassment to the conference i can't believe and then he goes that's it you're out of here and so now i'm in the middle of um illinois college and they're indoor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i'm in the middle team camp area you know the throwing venues down on one end and high jumps on the other end and i just i just let him know that i would glad i said i would gladly get thrown out of any meat if it's for my team and he says that's it you're out of here and so kick me out of the building uh, Commissioners there everything my first and so roger comes up and goes what the happened and i'm like roger i just got thrown out of the meet i'm sorry i just got thrown out of the building roger he goes what the he goes no you've worked too hard your kids have worked too hard you need to stay here to watch them he said so go over on the other side of the track sit on that bench we'll take care of it well as i'm sitting there everybody's like what you know the 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 building's like what's going on type of thing it was the last race of the day last event um and all of a sudden uh Coach Pio from Knox and his athlete come by. And I'm like, hey, I'm like, he's like, what are you doing over here, Sean? I said, I got kicked out. I, I, I can't go on the other side of that track. And he goes, what happened? I said, well, we got kicked out because we impeded your four by four. Well, the athlete he was with was the young man that was involved in it. He goes, coach, no, your kid just going into the turn floated out like everybody else does. And he didn't impede me. I said, well, somebody said he did. And we got kicked out or we got DQ'd and now I'm things led to one thing led to another and I'm sitting over here. And so, um, yeah, that was, um, that was an interesting phone call to my athletic director. So um, it just told me about, um, how another sport coach that we have was getting in trouble a little bit. And so I was like, um, Chris, um, I just got thrown out of a track me. <laughs> <laughs> which no ad has ever gotten that phone call no. it's like wait a minute so hold on i got like a billion questions first of all i love your passion because you were talking about you had scored one point and this was the so it's not like this was for the team title yep. but it meant so much of like these kids had done so much through that point of the season yep. have, you know competed that hard they deserved that eighth place at one point and it didn't matter. Uh, it didn't change the standings. It didn't change nope. anything, but it was like, no, no, this I'm fighting for my kids. Love, yep. love, love, love that passion. Um, I have to believe that that was a catalyst when we talk about bringing the team together of like, Oh, the head coach, who's the distance coach. Oh yeah. No, he cares about me as a sprinter or me yep. as a throw. Like, Oh, he's the, he's the, the head coach, not the distance coach who happens to be in charge of the, the, the total team. That's amazing. My real question is, <laughs> official do officials really have that power to just automatically throw you out like, i don't know i don't know if they have the power to throw you i think they can throw you out like remove you i don't know if they can remove you from the building though that that, that was the part that was impressive in basketball they have to throw two technicals right to throw they can't just yeah. throw you out that's throw two technicals uh in soccer right they have a yellow and a red card yeah they can throw even co uh, the coaches they red card and yellow card whatever I was not under the <laughs> how much power uh, officials that are listening right now uh, that you could just toss us out. I, I remember an incident when I was coaching at Ball State, 
that they probably should have thrown me out, uh, <laughs> but they didn't. Like I hopped over the fence. I was like, what the, you know, uh, yep. I, I didn't know they had the power, man. That's uh, yeah. think about that coaches before you start <laughs> re- show the passion, but show the restraint, I guess maybe is yeah. the, uh, the I, key word there. Yeah. I, I, I quickly learned uh, that I was happy. I was, I didn't, um, uh, names or swear or anything I kept, you know, and I just, um, but it certainly, uh, let the team know. I actually, when I got to the bus, they, that, uh, uh, we had waited around and, um, you know, we were, all the coaches were talking to me, you know, and jabbing me in that. And coach Haynes was like, Darn, that was something I've been trying to do forever. You get to do it. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so I get on the bus and the whole team stands up and oh, yeah, that was it. I was in after that the they were hooked and it was a smaller squad but that's that set the as you said that that was kind of one of the big catalysts into like hey this is this is his team and we're gonna follow uh what he wants us to do because he 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 cares about us cares yeah i think that's what it showed the most maybe in a not the most professional way that you want to do it ideal way i guess but but the commissioner never said anything to me I'm just glad you didn't uh, you didn't Bobby Knight it and throw a chair or anything like that. Thanks for keeping the uh, physical violence down to zero. Um, so you got to Carroll around 02, I think you said. Yep, January roughly. of 02. And so roughly 04, you're the head coach. Yeah, so it would be uh, so be the spring of the spring season of 03. 03. So let's work on bringing a lots of value here because okay. now you've been at the institution for you're going on probably around your what's math 19th 20th year roughly right so yes. knowing we'll just say 19 we don't need to go above that number. don't go two decades no it's a <laughs> like you, you get a plaque on your 20th right when you're there for 20 years uh use you know knowing the story that we just heard there about okay you know i i showed the kids who i was right i showed the 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 care that i had for all of our athletes how have you in those 19 20 years what what are some of the things you know culture is a is an important thing right it's one of the hardest things to build and it's one of the easiest things to destroy what are some things that you've done holistically for the culture of your program all the way from, you know, the types and people of assistant coaches that you bring in the athletes. And we don't always bat a hundred percent with the athletes that fit in. Sometimes yep. we get athletes that don't, uh, travel, um, showing you care. Let's talk to us about just that culture building part of, of the program that you've been, you brought in. Well, the number one thing, um, that I, I forget who, who told me it, it might've been Roger, um, was that, and some other coaches, and I, I truly feel this, and that's it's kind of how I've the approach I've taken is that your athletes are a direct reflection of the head coach. How they act, how they do everything is a direct reflection of the head coach. And uh, a so then if if I'm going to buy that, then I, I need to get assistant coaches who who agree and buy into what I do. Um, and the other thing that that I had to do is I had to empower those assistant coaches to feel. Like they were the head coaches of their event groups. Mm. Like, Hey, I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. So I've really got to find great coaches to, to assist me with my weaknesses. And, but they have to have that same vision and that, that same goal. We all want to get to that same goal as coaches. We just all do it in a different way, say different words, but getting assistants who, who, who fall into that and really want to do it. And I've been, blessed here to have some great assistant coaches, you know, Justin Troller ran for me. And then he, he, he's been with me ever since, um, Josh Hurlibus, uh, ran for me, all American. He coached with me, uh, Rob Bennett, who, who I ran with, I was his block holder my freshman year. Uh, when it's actually, he's the first person I reached out to when I got the job was Rob to come over and coach me because I know Rob was an alum from here. Um, and part of that with those assistants is finding somebody potentially from within the university who still cares to show the athletes that this is a lifelong commitment or that it means more to them than just coming at four for practice and then walking away at six when it's all done. It means something mm-hmm. um, and trying to get athletes like that so that they can see things. And I think more recently it's been bringing in female assistant coaches 
in positions like uh, Taylor Wilch. Uh, she is our sprint coach. Her husband, Corey Wilch, was our sprint coach the year before. Then he went on to UWM as their sprint coach. Well, then we brought in uh, Taylor Wilch. Um, and it's it's been awesome to see that uh, that transformation within the sprint group. Um, and, uh, you know, Danielle Kerrigan with Pole Vault, uh, once again, a, a very decorated athlete who's very knowledgeable and smart about her event. Uh, Coach Pete Delzer um, has been with me. My first full-time assistant he's, that I, I got was true track assistant, um, has been with me. I think this is going to be Peter's fifth year. Um, it's a great partnership and just finding those coaches who you don't have to tell them necessarily what they have to do. They, they know. So, um, and just do a, a tremendous, uh, job with, uh, coach Jess Lauren has been with me ever since she ran. Um, uh, and, uh, just some amazing people that way. I think, you know, and, the other thing is we kind of touched on it before is that person on the left and that person on, on your right are the most important people mm -hmm. on the team and getting those athletes who, cause you want to get the best of the best. But when you come into college and you've been the best of the best, sometimes when you get to that next level, you're not having the same success Often. As you did at the high school level. Yeah. And so getting them to buy into that um, helps ease that pressure on them that, Oh, I've always been first or I've always done this and that. And then they get to college and they, and they don't take first or they don't make finals. And they're like, coach, what? It's like, Oh, it, it, it's okay. And, um, you know, that's been huge. And, um, and just changing what the image of the university of, of our program, you know, a private college, a lot of it's known, well, you gotta be smart, you know, you know, you talk to high school coaches. Well, coach, if I got some smart kids who are looking to run track, I'll send them your way. I'm like, whoa, stop. It, you know, we're, that just because it's a private school doesn't mean that they have to be these exceptional, exceptional 4.0 students. Um, and we work with kids who, who aren't. And, you know, that's the benefit of a private school is you, you have a little bit more freedoms in that. And, Getting the 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 image in the face of Carroll University has been something that we continue to work on, uh, but I, I think that the most important change that I've brought and the things that we try to promote here is the, you know, is what we started this conversation on is that team first atmosphere and that family first atmosphere and, um, you know, having the kids over to or not I shouldn't say kids but the young men and women over for. Uh, you know, pancakes at our house, you know, at my house or, you know, things like that, just doing little things to make them feel wanted, you know, uh, making them feel welcome, making them feel that they have a role and uh, taking the, 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 the time to build an individual relationship. And, um, you know, you're never going to have those relationships with everybody. Uh, but just knowing that when that season's done and that year's done is, listening to them. Um, you know, we got athletes who really want to go to big meets, you know, want to go to Drake or want to go to an NCAA championship. And so making sure that they have those avenues and going to the administration on their behalf to be an advocate for them, because that's your best thing as a head coach is you're the advocate for your athletes. Mm -hmm. You're the advocate for your team. You're the voice. Um, and getting the, the capability, maybe some, some ex extra funds or, whatever to get these kids to go to big meets like that has been huge. And, um, you know, we were blessed to have two national champions this, this past year in the throws. And, you know, those, those two athletes got to go to a, a division one meet uh, to throw against that town. So when they got to a national meet, they knew who they were going to go to. And, you know, Amanda Treloff, I look back at um, as a javelin thrower, she went to Drake one year and she, she threw against the, uh, an Olympian and watching her because you can't get real close at Drake. So you got to stand back and just watching her. You could see her hand literally shaking as she's holding the javelin. But then, you know, she goes on to be a nat national champion because once again, she starts to feel comfortable and just putting him in comfortable situations and removing the, the, the pressure of competition off of them and getting them. I know it sounds corny, but getting them to look at themselves in the mirror and smile at themselves is big then they've kind of accepted themselves and 
uh, are proud of themselves and have the beginning of self-confidence. What I hear you saying, it actually, to me, harkens back to what you talked about with Coach Arndt. You're talking about believing in them so that they can start believing in themselves. You know, I, I, I could see, you know, haven't gone to Drake many, many times and watched the Javelin specifically. Like I can picture being up on that hill, looking yep. down and <laughs> seeing her shake. And you're like, oh, no, no, you deserve to be here. Like you, you, yep. you, you, um, you deserve this. Like you belong here and having to prove to them that they, that you, that you belong here and having them receive that self-confidence and that self-worth. And then the next time, maybe it was at the national meet, she's at the next big meet and it's like, Oh yeah. Okay. Wait a minute. I threw against Olympians. I, you know, I held my own at Drake. Like I, I I'm here. I, I, this is my talent. This is who I am in, in this role. And I, I belong here and I can do this. So I hear that kind of that same yeah. philosophy and belief that coach aren't had with you of, believing in you before you could believe in yourself. And that's how you're now transferring what coach art taught you into today's athletes. Oh, that's a good point. I never thought of it that way. Thank that's you. my, that's my job. That's my job here, Sean. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you, you learn a lot, you know, this is very um, selfish, you know, after interviewing a hundred plus coaches, so a hundred amazing men and women who do unbelievably great things in this sport on all levels, high school, college, uh, having agents on the show, uh, things like that. You, you, you get, you get real perspective on leaders. I, I probably should have titled this podcast, the leadership podcast, because that's what it really is. It's men and women who lead yeah. our young people in today's. And so, you know, leadership matters, maybe matters more today <laughs> than it ever has. Yes. Go back to what you talked about. You said, you know, you work on empowering your assistant coaches to be the head coach of their group. Every time I interview a head coach, and I did it with you, I always ask, so what was your oh crap? You know, you get there and you're yeah. never prepared. Uh, now I've had a couple of coaches that are like, oh, you know what? I, I wasn't prepared for all of it, but because of my former head coach, uh, yeah, I knew budgeting. Like he or she allowed me to be involved in the budgeting process. So it was not just this slap in the face when I became the head coach. So what things do you do to help empower them to become better assistant coaches, and I'm going to call them future head coaches, even though they yep. may not even want that. So when you say you empower them to be, uh, be their own head coach of their uh, event group, what are some of the things that you do to help them grow? I, I, I give them control. I, I say, hey, let me know what you're doing. I, I want to know what you're doing because most of those assistants are going to be part-time. So you have athletes who come in during the day. I, I want to be able to speak to them. Um, you know, it's about what they're doing in that, but Hey, you're, you're in control. You're the head coach. If you have a, a, a discipline issue that you want to, uh, or, or an idea or whatever that you want to get across, you, you know, you go ahead. I'm more than happy to talk to you about it and give you my input, but it's, that's your group. That's your group. I want them to look up to you. Um, I want them to come to you when they have questions or when they, have a misunderstanding, even if it's about life or it's about school, I want you to grow those connections and have that form of communication and grow that communication with them where they begin to trust in you, that, that they can trust you not, not only with just track stuff, but with just the everyday life stuff, a, a bad exam or a new relationship or just broke up with somebody or something within the, the family, you know, with everything in our society now with the COVID and that just, you know, being able to have somebody to reach out to and feel comfortable being able to reach out to that's 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 not a mom or a dad and giving them that outlet here on campus that they have somebody who they can look up to and can turn to and feel safe with um, I guess is the best way that I I can put it but I I give them full goal with their their training plans and that you know I I ask to see it and I'll, I'll ask questions about things uh, but they're the they're the head sprint coach and they're the head throws coach and the head jumps coach and uh, the head pole vault coach and hurdles and that. And then it, it's fun to see the assistants interact within each other hmm. uh, to have those communications just with each other about, Hey, I have so-and-so and this is what's going on. How have you, you know, and just to see, and that builds that camaraderie. Yeah. And that's what gets us to that, that main picture and that main goal that we all have in mind. And there's things that I, I'm going to want to say and do as a team that they may not agree with, but, you know, we sit behind a closed door and we talk and I actually empower them where in meetings, I'm like, Hey, here, that's a great idea. But if I bring it up, they're going to be like, no, 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 no. 
that and so all right hey you guys bring it up they'll buy in just like that or they'll say yes great idea because you're the head coach and no one wants to talk to you now nobody makes, nobody likes the makes a lot of the crabby guy <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the the head coach in a, in a servant leadership style which is what you're describing here sean as the head coach you serve the assistant coaches it's, it's kind of an opposite of that pyramid you know where yep. the president sits up top and they are in charge of x and y and z you're actually like you're beholden to your assistant coaches the next layer up if you will in our reverse pyramid um example here is your team captains uh what how do you select team captains as someone who's you know a new head coach right now they're trying to figure out how to do their own team captains what's your kind of philosophy on team captains there at carol this is actually a great question this is one of the things that we talk about when we recruit is we actually don't have any captains okay i was i was wondering i was kind of hoping you didn't because i know i've heard of this before so yes. talk to us why, why not this is blasphemy everybody has captains right we, why, why not jason gosa who uh was my my first assistant sprint coach for my second sprint coach when I was here as an alum here, he brought up the idea of why do we have captains, Sean? Captains are, a lot of the times, captains aren't the leaders on the team. Maybe the best leaders, they're maybe the most popular or they're, mm -hmm. you know. And so he said, let's, let's, let's empower everybody. Let's empower a freshman who just walks on campus to feel like they have the right to speak and they have that line of communication with you or whoever to come and just talk with you. So I always say it's the fishing story. When you catch a fish, it's this big. But if they come and talk to you as a captain and you're like, whatever, that fish was only that big, coach. Or coach, you should have seen it. It was like that. You know, it, it, it could go, I want to hear from you and I want to see that emotion and that, that energy from you and what it means, because that's what it's going to tell me what it means to you. And that's the most important thing with, with that is that relationship is I don't want to have to hear something that you're having a, a problem with or what the team's doing, going through a voice or two people, because they, everybody views it differently. And so it's going to get changed no matter what, even the, the best you know, you, you watch law and order or whatever, you know, somebody, everybody sees it differently mm -hmm. and they try to always pick, all right, well, that's the same. That's the same. And, and so that's what it is. It's the open door policy of the office. As a freshman, you can walk in here and we can have any conversation. And um, I know some of the other coaches in my department kind of laugh at me and make fun of me, but um, I think empowering each athlete to be a leader and giving them that it be it vocal be it uh, visual, be it through example. There's so many different forms of leadership and helping them grow and mature as, as that way is, is huge. And once again, that's that whole self-confidence thing is like, wow, they believe in me or as you, you know, we kind of discussed um, and just giving them that opportunity to, to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Then what we do is you can see as a coach, you can see who people are drawn to. Mm -hmm. You can see who the leaders are on the team by just watching from afar. Mm -hmm. We then use those people to get what's going on within the team or to help get things out, ideas out within the team, you know, get the feel of the team. And so that's, that's, that's how we do it here. So we, we, we give everybody the chance to lead. We, we empower them to be a leader and for their voice to be heard. But at the same time, we're watching to see who are the natural leaders. Who who does everybody go to? If I need to do this, I'm going to go to Mike on this one because I think Mike would be a great person to get this across. And I think they'll believe it. Um, and then other things, it's like, oh, maybe nice. Let's let's try this person. And, you know, and you you see as a coach, you know, who people are drawn to and who who who's a follower, who's a leader, and. Um, and so we do it, we do it that way. You know, I certainly talk to our upper classmen a lot about ideas and things like that, but I try not to all, always pick the same two or three people always to talk to, um, you know, I'll talk to sophomores and say, Hey, you know, you're going to be important this year. Um, you're a great connection between the upper classmen and that first year group. I think you're going to be the key into getting that team to buy into each other and getting it to, 
um, to to grow and and mature it as a family. And so, um, I mean, I, I love that question. I, I have parents who like, what? You don't have? Yeah. Like, no, it's, I want your son or daughter to feel like they are a part of something and they have a voice the minute they walk on this campus. Leaders grow leaders. So I, I love that you as the head coach growing your assistant coaches as leaders, you guys and gals as a staff growing your team into leaders, you know, 99.99% of all of, not just your athletes, all of our NCAA and NAI, all of our <laughs> collegiate athletes are not going to go on to a pro track career. They're all going to go on to become moms and dads, uh, uh, bank people, accountants, doctors, teachers, coaches, and in every position like that, we we need leaders. Leaders, what makes this world go round? So I, yeah. I just love that. That's your philosophy. That's not a standard question for me. I bet you in a hundred plus interviews, I've asked that maybe maybe one or two other times. So I knew something about you, Sean. I just I was like, I know this is going to be this a is... lot of value, a lot of value. <laughs> and um, I just the a great representation of what we just talked about with the with with the athletes and with empowering the assistant coaches is. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, my son was diagnosed with leukemia on his sixth birthday. So I had to literally pull away from, from coaching. You know, Carol was awesome. They, they let me, you know, the beginning of work from home for me type of thing. And I was away every weekday. I would try to get to meets if I could, but that is when our program turned that is when we really started to take off because wow. of i would still send workouts and that to the distance kids and that and still have some you know communication with the assistants and that but they were running the show and these athletes were and it was amazing i've done lead, leadership um speaking engagements where i'm like hey i don't need to be there for us to be successful i may be a face of Cary university on campus but it's it's, it's not me. I'm, I'm a very small, minute piece of this. And that was awesome for me to see was just the uh, success of the team and just how, how, you know, it, it blows you away a little bit, like, wow, maybe some of the things have worked in that, but just to see those athletes rally and lead and the assistant coaches take command and just lead and just, run full force ahead as if I'm here, mm -hmm. but I'm not. And it was just amazing just to watch our, our program take off. And I, I credit those two years to our, our program, our assistant coaches, our athletes, our alumni, just huge. It if was you, awesome. If you take away one piece and the house falls down, I'm not sure you were a right, the right leader. <laughs> the right leader <laughs> yeah. builds everybody. Yeah. That takes, that takes uh, some, a lot of humility and um, the right sized ego. So, I mean, that's amazing. That had to make you feel, first of all, it was needed, right? Like yeah. the house was going to continue to grow or it was going to fall down because you had to take care of much, much more important things, family, yeah. you know, family. It had to be so like, uh, um, I know you wouldn't describe it like this, but pat on your back of like, oh, thank goodness. Okay, I am helping run this program the right way because I can step away and it still flourishes. Like that's the yeah. that's the sign of leadership right there, Sean. So the scary thing is, is that it flourished more without me here. Than <laughs> no, no, that's not <laughs> scary. That's exactly the way it should be. Absolutely. So Sean, as we wrap up today, talk to us about today. What has got you excited? We're coming into 2022 track season and cross country season. You're at the, the lake practicing. What's got you excited here for Carroll University? A, a, a new beginning. Every year is that, that new beginning. And this year, especially with cross country, because we didn't have a year last year. And these athletes have been biting at the bit. You got high school athletes who didn't have a year. And so they're just that uniqueness that this year brings and that unknown. You know, they, they just did the Division three rankings. And you look at the rankings and you're like, you know, we have new uh, regions this year and all that stuff. And it's, you know, I'm excited to carve a path with a new team. Awesome and uh, watch these young ladies and young men grow and mature as the season goes on and go through the highs and the lows with them and be there their, just to get back into that competitive environment. It, it is a competitive sport. It, it is the reason why we come out because we like to compete. Love to see 
how athletes respond to adverse situations in the mm-hmm. sport across country at some point, no matter what, you're going to have discomfort and how you attack that. And that's the part of coaching that I love the best is how to convince an athlete to accept being comfortable when they're uncomfortable. Man, that's it. Success is, is born on the back of <laughs> adversity, not <laughs> sipping my ties on the cruise ship. That's exactly right, man. I yeah. love it, Sean. But we're excited to see you, to see your team and uh, the rest of your conference. What an amazing conference you have there, by the way. Uh, yeah. I, please tell us you've never gotten thrown out again. That, that was a one time. No, no okay. that was a, that, I've gotten a look and I <laughs> slow down. <laughs> Gotten a look. I've gotten a look. So I've known to slow down. I bet you've given some officials the look <laughs> back. Like, hey, you remember you hear, you know who I am. I got thrown out. I'm not afraid of this at all. Uh Sean, man, uh, you know, again, I say this every show, and it's extremely vital and important to me because it's the truth. The most important thing that you can ever give me and us here is your time. And I'm just so thankful that you would spend your time with us today learning about your amazing, unique journey. I love it. Uh, I love the influence of people like Coach Arndt and many, many other coaches that we talked about today it's awesome that's that's what we're made of you know no one person is an island on their own right no one person is is, does it on their own we are an amalgamation of lots of uh positive and negative influences and boy did you have a ton of great positive influences and you're now turning that over the past 20 plus years and you're giving those positive influences to other young men and women out there through the sport of track and field and it's awesome man that's uh leaders do what leaders do my friend and you are you're leading Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. This is awesome that you've taken the time to, to, to bring the sport of track and field uh, up and to, to, to continue it as a, as a, a major sport. Uh, uh, normally, it's a sport that's seen every four years. And I'm just excited that for since you've begun this, it's kept the sport of track and field um, in the national light. And I'm humbled to be a part of it. Number one, some of the coaches you've had on and Athia, I, I, I'm not sure why I'm on this side of the screen over here. So <laughs> it's because coach aren't taught me, Sean, that <laughs> you are important. You belong here. You deserve this. And, you know, I should have started this from the get go. I got to give a shout out to some mutual friends of ours way back in episode 22. If you haven't listened to it, you got to go listen to it. It's one of my favorite early OG episodes. We had Eric Kramer and Nicole Farr Kramer on the show. We were discussing primarily, we talked about their paths into coaching, but primarily I had them on the show because I wanted to talk about the uniquenesses of being a married couple that coaches. So they both coach on the collegiate level. Both of them are awesome. I've known Eric since he was a high schooler for crying out loud. Yeah, well, that just means I'm old. Sean. Uh, but after interviewing them, they reached out uh, and said, Hey, you know, who would be awesome on the show. You got to go interview Sean Tielitz from Carol. And, you know, you and I have done some work together over yeah. my 15 years. And I was like, you know what, Sean is a good dude. Uh, unfortunately it took me this long to, to get him on the show. <laughs> that, that's all on your host here. That's all my fault. Uh, but just want to shout out to Eric and Nicole. You guys nailed it. You're right. Sean belongs here. Awesome story. And uh, I'm so happy that Sean, you'd allow you to be open and authentic with us and allow us to share your story with our, with our audience. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, go piles, go piles, baby. And thank you. Go you listener. I appreciate you being here again. I'm just so humbled that you would just join us every week. I see the numbers and we continue to grow and I'm just so proud. And really it has nothing to do with us. I'm just a conduit to, I'm the one who hits the record button. It's these coaches that join us. Like Sean talked about the amazing coaches we've had every single one of them. It does not matter the school that they're at. It doesn't. It's because of who they are, the positive influence that they make right where their two feet are. That's what's important. That's what makes them such amazing people. So join us next week. We're going to have another amazing person. I don't know who it's going to be. You, you got to show up and figure it out because we'll, we'll learn together. So thanks again for being here. If you receive value, I'm going to go out on a limb and say someone else in your network would receive value. Hit the share button, text message, email, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you young cats are doing now. I don't even know anymore, but share it to someone else and they would probably receive value as well. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next week.